We may do something with that book at some point. And they're in the, the table. It's very good, according to Rosina. She's already read it. You, you just make us all look bad, Rosina. <laughs> One week and you've got the book read. I haven't even opened it yet. <laughs> it's an easy read. And it's on the, the desk in the fellowship hall. Um, and just a couple of other announcements. I, think, I just wanted to thank the people that put all the boxes together for the Samaritan Purse, uh, Operation Christmas Child Boxes. I think that was done this last week. And um, so thank you for that. Are we still collecting stuff for the military boxes? I wasn't sure. I left that up. But if we are, if you have a name uh, of a person, please get that to Marianne as well. Any other announcements? Yeah. Uh, any other announcements that uh, did not make it either into the bulletin or up there? So it should be, and I don't have that up there because it's this. Are we, we went back to the second Tuesday, right? Yeah. Or not Tuesday, but Thursday. Second Thursday, okay. right? So this Thursday, we have a board meeting. This Thursday. That would be the second Thursday. It is the second Thursday. Okay? Sorry about that. I forgot that we switched that back. The second Thursday. So this Thursday, we have a board meeting. Next semester, we'll get back to a normal schedule. So it's the next semester for me because that's what's causing it. <laughs> Next semester, I only teach one class on Monday, so it won't get in the way of our Tuesday meetings. <laughs> all right. Well, I um, also wanted to thank all of you who uh, gave the gift to Mary and I for pastor appreciation. Um, yes. My daughter mentioned, oh, I didn't even know it was pastor appreciation month. Our church didn't do anything. <laughs> I said, well, my church always remembers. I don't know why, but they always remember, and we thank you very much for that. Um, let's stand. And we will open in a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for this time. We pray as we come to your table, as we proclaim our faith, as we sing these songs and listen to your word, that your spirit will be at work in our hearts and our lives. That you will be at work in our church and bringing, bringing us into one mind, one spirit. And Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> We're going to sing because we believe, but before we do that, uh, let's go ahead and let's uh, say together the Apostles' Creed, which the song is based on. Let's say it with me. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's sing. We believe in God the Father. We believe in God the Father. We believe in Christ the Son. Holy Spirit, we believe in the Holy Spirit. We are the church and we stand as one. We are the church and we stand as one. We believe in the Holy Bible. We believe in the Holy Bible. We believe in the Virgin Birth. Resurrection. We believe in the resurrection. Christ one day will return to earth. The Christ one day will return to earth. Holy, holy, holy is our God. Worthy, worthy.
us raise to Jesus. Sing to the come, let us sing a song, a song declaring we belong to Jesus. He's all we need. Lift up our heart of praise. Sing now with voices raised to Jesus. The King. Why don't you take a few minutes and greet those who are here this morning? <clears throat> The Lamb that was slain, life and salvation His empire shall bring, and joy to the nations when Jesus is King. Come, let us sing a song, a song declaring we belong to Jesus. He's all we need. Lift up a heart of praise. Sing now with voices raised to Jesus. Sing to the King. and we pray we will be ready the dawn of that day we'll join in singing with all the redeemed cause Satan is vanquished and Jesus is king come let us sing a song to the King. Let's go ahead and find our seats. I need to get my hand for you. <laughs> As we prepare for communion, let's uh, sing the song, Sing to Jesus. I was saying, this is a song I'll never stop doing. You know, some songs they just, at some point, ah, oh, that's not that great of a song, <laughs> and you just move on. This is one of those few songs that will make it into hymn books in 300 years, <laughs> because it just isn't going to go away. It's such a, a great message.
I could have a couple of our guys to come down to help with passing out communion. We invite you to join us as we take communion together. Uh, let's give thanks for the bread, and as we pass out the bread, we are going to sing We Are One Body. Um, I mention often that one of the purposes of communion, it has several, one of the purposes is to proclaim the Lord's death until he comes, and that proclamation, I think, is intended to go more towards those who don't know him than it is to one another. Uh, one of the other reasons why we take communion is that it is a sign that we are willing to share the table together. Um, in a world where that was not true, remember as we went through Ephesians, guys, it was very rare that a Gentile and a Jew, in fact, it was almost never, <laughs> would eat at the same table. It was also rare that sometimes that a Greek and a Roman would sit at the same table. Believe it or not, husbands and wives did not eat together in the first century. And yet, when Christ instituted this meal, it changed a lot of things. It brought together husbands and wives. Slaves and their masters wouldn't dream of eating at the same table. And yet, at this table, they are both welcome. And Jews and Gentiles, husbands and wives, Greeks and Romans, and so it became a picture of the unity we have in Christ. And I pray that it continues to do so, even though we don't have quite the divisions around the table that they had then, we still have many divisions. And this can be a symbol that we are not divided in Christ Jesus. Let's give thanks for the bread. Lord, we thank you for your sacrifice and your willingness to lay down your body for us. The brokenness on the cross wrenches our heart as we think of what you were willing to do in obedience to the Father to bring reconciliation to us. Lord, I pray that as we take this bread together that it will truly symbolize our faith in the sacrifice that you made and a willingness for that sacrifice to unite us above all things pushing aside all differences that we might be one in you and your love for us and that love flowing through us for others. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. 
many. We are one body. We are one body in Christ. Though we are many, we are one body. We are one body. Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us take the bread together. Let's give thanks for the cup. Lord, you say that the life is in the blood. And you poured out your life for us on that cross 2,000 years ago. Lord, we give thanks. We give thanks for this cup that reminds us of what you did that could join us together. Lord, even as you were transforming a society 2,000 years ago by bringing people together to share a meal, a meal to remind them of what you had done to make them brothers and sisters, a part of the same family. Lord, I pray that we too, in this day, can take this cup, remember what you have done, to bring us together, to make us a part of the same family, to be brothers and sisters in Christ, to be mothers and fathers and children. Lord, we give you thanks, for you did not leave us, you did not forsake us, but you sought us and you brought us home, and you have wrapped your loving arms around your people Lord, we just want to give you praise for the love that you have shown us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, to see the dawn of the darkest day Christ on the road to Calvary, tried by sinful men, torn and beaten then, nailed to a cross of wood. This the power of the cross.
daylight flees. Now the ground beneath quakes as its maker bows his head. Curtain torn in two, dead a race to Let's take the cup. <laughs> In the same way, also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's take the cup together.
seated. The children are dismissed to Children's Church. You can turn into your Bibles to Genesis 24. I was going to tell you this morning, and since I didn't do it, especially next week, we need to turn these off because next week, <laughs> we should do it every Sunday, but next week, Leroy is going to be here and he's going to be showing a video and we're trying to test something. We're trying to figure out why we get pauses on Sunday morning, but never any other time. And we think this is our problem, that when we all have our phones on, so not just turn them down, turn them off. Because we're thinking that our phones are picking up our things and it's creating a delay in our action between the computers. So remember next week, if I forget, turn your phone off. And that will help that video run more correctly when he uses it. It's not as big a deal on this stuff. Um, if you give me a second, I'll turn this around. And I want to change the setting so I can see it here. You probably noticed that I have a hard time seeing things. So I saw ground when you saw wound. Did you catch that? <laughs> but I want to point out that, you know, there is a story about Jesus writing in the ground. And I've always thought he was writing names of the sinners who were deserving of death. So even my line still works there, but I had nothing to do with that. It has to do with that I am blind <laughs> and slowly... Uh, but surely getting more blind and more deaf as I get older. Uh, let me see if I can remove this little thing. Get it out of our way. Maybe not. There we go. We have a very long text this morning. And so I'm doing everything I can to, to try to keep you uh, interested in it. Because it'll take half the sermon just to read the story. But you kind of have to read it to see what's going on. And so this comes from Genesis chapter 24. It is um, Abraham sending his servant to get uh, Isaac a wife. And there is some repetition in this story as, as we see um, uh, things are retold more than once. The Bible does this quite often, especially in the book of Genesis. And, and there's a reason for it, and that's why I hesitate to just skip the repetition, because the Bible did it intentionally. They want you to see the repetition so you see what's important uh, in the story. But let's uh, begin by reading this. I have given a couple of ellipses if you're following along in your Bible, um, just to make it slightly briefer. Now Abraham was old, well advanced in years, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. And Abraham said to his servant, the oldest of his household, who had charge of all that he had, Put your hand under my thigh that I may make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and God of the earth, that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell, but will go to my country and to my kindred and take a wife for my own son Isaac. The servant said to him, Perhaps the woman may not be willing to follow me to this land. Must I then take your son back to the land from which you came? And Abraham said to him, See to it that you do not take my son back there. The Lord, he will send his angel before you, and you shall take a wife for my son from there. But if the woman is not willing to follow you, then you will be free from this oath of mine. Only you must not take my son back there. Then the servant took ten of his master's camels, and departed, taking all sorts of choice gifts from his master. And he rose and went to Mesopotamia to the city of Nahor. And he made the camels kneel down outside the city by the well of water at the time of evening. In the time when women go out to draw water. 
And he said, O Lord, God of my master, Abraham, please grant me success today and show steadfast love to my master, Abraham. Behold, I am standing by the spring of water, and the daughters of the men of the city are coming out to draw water. Let the young woman to whom I shall say, Please let down your jar that I may drink. And who shall say, Drink, and I will water your camels. Let her be the one whom you have appointed for your servant Isaac. By this I shall know that you have shown steadfast love to my master. Before he had finished speaking, behold, Rebekah, who was born to Bethuel, the son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, came out with her water jar on her shoulder. The young woman, the young woman was very attractive in appearance, a maiden whom no man had known. She went down to the spring and filled her jar and came up. Then the servant ran to meet her and said, Please give me a little water to drink from your jar. She said, Drink, my lord. And she quickly let down her jar upon her hand and gave him a drink. And when she had finished giving him a drink, she said, I will draw water for your camels also until they have finished drinking. So she quickly emptied her jar into the trough and ran again to the well to draw water. And she drew for all his camels. And the man gazed at her in silence to learn whether the Lord had prospered his journey or not. And when the camels had finished drinking, the man took a gold ring weighing a half shekel and two bracelets for her arms weighing ten gold shekels and said, Please tell me whose daughter you are. Is there room in your father's house for us to spend the night? She said to him, I am the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Milcah, whom she bore to Nahor. And she added, We have plenty of both straw and fodder and room to spend the night. And the man bowed his head and worshipped the Lord and said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who has not forsaken his steadfast love and his faithfulness toward my master. As for me, the Lord has led me in the way to the house of my master's kinsmen. Then the young woman ran and told her mother's household about these things. And Rebekah had a brother whose name was Laban. And Laban ran out toward the man to the spring. And as soon as he saw the ring and the bracelets on his sister's arms and heard the words of Rebekah, his sister, thus the man spoke to me, he went to the man. And behold, he was standing by the camels at the spring, and he said, Come in, O blessed of the Lord. Why do you stand outside? For I have prepared the house and a place for the camels. So the man came to the house and unharnessed the camels and gave straw and fodder, fodder to the camels. And there was water to wash his feet and the feet of the men who were with him. And then food was set before him to eat. But he said, I will not eat until I have said what I have to say. And he said, speak on. So he said, I am Abraham's servant. The Lord has greatly blessed my master and he has become great. He has given him flocks and herds, silver and gold, male servants and female servants, camels and donkeys. And Sarah, my master's wife, bore a son to my master when she was old. And to him he has given all that he has. My master made me swear, saying, You shall not take a wife from my son, from the daughters of the Canaanites, in whose land I dwell. But you shall go to my father's house and to my clan and take a wife for my son. I said to my master, Perhaps the woman will not follow me. But he said to me, The Lord before whom I have walked will send his angel with you and prosper your way. You shall take a wife for my son from my clan and from my father's house, and if they will not give her to you, you will be free from my oath. I came today to the spring, and I said, O oh Lord, the God of my master Abraham, if now you are prospering the way that I go, behold, I am standing by the spring of water. Let the virgin who comes out to draw water, to whom I shall say, Please give me a little water from your jar to drink. And who will say to me, Drink, and I will draw for your camels also. Let her be the woman whom the Lord has appointed for my master's son. Before I had finished speaking in my heart, behold, Rebekah came out with her water jar on her shoulder. 
And she went down to the spring and drew water. And I said to her, please let me drink. And she quickly let down her jar from her shoulder and said, drink and I will give your camels drink also. So I drank and she gave the camels drink also. And then I asked her, whose daughter are you? And she said, the daughter of Bethuel, Nahor's son, who Milka bore to him. So I put the ring on her nose and the bracelets on her arm. And then I bowed my head and worshipped the Lord and blessed the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who had led me by the right way to take the daughter of my master's kinsman for his son. Now then, if you are going to show steadfast love and faithfulness to my master, tell me, and if not, tell me, that I may turn to the right hand or to the left. And then Laban and Bethuel answered and said, The thing has come from the Lord. We cannot speak to you bad or good. Behold, Rebekah is before you. Take her and go, and let her be the wife of your master's son, as the Lord has spoken. When Abraham's servant heard their words, he bowed himself to the earth before the Lord, and the servant brought out jewelry of silver and of gold and garments and gave them to Rebekah. And he also gave to her brother and, and to her mother costly ornaments. And he, had, and he and the men who were with him ate and drank, and they spent the night there. And when they arose in the morning, he said, Send me away to my master. And her brother and her mother said, Let the young woman remain with us a while, at least ten days. After that she may go. But he said to them, Do not delay me, since the Lord has prospered my way. Send me away, that I may go to my master. And they said, Let us call the young woman and ask her. And they called Rebekah and said to her, Will you go with this man? She said, I will go. So they sent away Rebekah, their sister. And they blessed Rebekah and said to her, Our sister, may you become thousands of ten thousands, and may your offspring possess the gate of those who hate him. I just have to pause here for a moment. I could not read that. May your offspring possess the gate of those who hate him. Who is her offspring? How about Jesus? May Jesus possess the gate of those who hate him. And the gates of hell will not prevail against him. I don't know if that was intentional, but I could not read that verse without thinking of, and the gates of hell will not prevail against him, her offspring. Um, then Rebecca and her young women, woman and her young women arose and rode on the camels and followed the man. Thus the servant took Rebecca and went his way. Now Isaac had returned from Beer Lahai Roy. And was dwelling in the Negev. And Isaac went out to meditate in the field toward evening. And he lifted up his eyes and saw, and behold, there was camels coming. And Rebekah lifted up her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she dismounted from the camel and said to the servant, Who is that man walking in the field to meet us? And the servant said, It is my master. So she took her veil and covered herself, and the servant told Isaac all the things that he had done. And then Isaac brought her into the tent of Sarah, his mother, and took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her. So Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. There's a couple of unique things in this passage that you don't find anywhere else in Scripture. Interestingly, because they're so popular today. The first one is this. There is nowhere else in Scripture that God actually chooses a wife for a man other than Eve. I guess you could argue Eve is another one. But typically, you do not have God directing someone and saying, this is the wife I have chosen for you. Yet we seem to think that God does that in every relationship. And maybe he does, but it really isn't talked about in Scripture. But it is here. God appointed Rebekah to be Isaac's wife before the two ever met, and I would probably argue before the two were ever born. There's no accident in them coming together. There's a second thing, and I think I've mentioned it in a few sermons ago. 
And it says, and Isaac loved her. It is the only time in Scripture where it says of a husband that he loved his wife. If that is not weird, I don't know what is. Now, it does say that Jacob loved Rachel, but that was before they were married, so it doesn't count. <laughs> he says he loved Rachel, but as after they get married, you never hear him repeating that statement to her. This is the only time it says of a husband that he loved his wife. Now, we know that we're commanded to love our wives, and that that is, in, is something that is to be um, every husband's goal and responsibility. I'm just pointing out this is the only time it's mentioned. And it's mentioned in an incredible context of an arranged marriage where God has been directing every step to bring these two together. Here's the challenge. The challenge is how do I apply this to this congregation? You have to imagine, guys, that when I prepare this message, I have two very different congregations in mind. The other congregation that I have, there are 20 people under the age of 25. This is an incredibly relevant passage for them. And they need to see a lot of the details in this text. It may not be as relevant for us. However, I would like to say that we all have children. We have grandchildren. Or we have nephews and nieces. And if you think about it, Abraham's 140 in this chapter, and he's the one that's really giving us most of the advice on how to pick a wife. So consequently, there's probably something for us to learn, at least in terms of sharing with our kids, sharing with younger people in our church or in our family or in our community, of the wisdom that Abraham follows in finding a wife for his son Isaac. And though we don't have arranged marriages anymore, it doesn't mean our kids don't listen to us or our grandkids won't listen to us. They do, at least occasionally. And we can learn a lot from this chapter on what we should be saying in this matter. Let me just say this as well. I think this chapter illustrates just how important the decision to get married is. It takes this decision so seriously at several points, and we'll see them, that it just makes you pause and go, whew, yeah, this, this decision, this is the biggest decision apart from a decision to follow Jesus Christ that a person is going to make. And therefore, they should be prepared for it. Genesis 24. I only have one slide for my sermon, by the way. <laughs> And that probably doesn't mean a lot. <laughs> but there is only one slide. <laughs> the right woman with the right stuff. Be patient. This is Abraham's advice to us. This should be our advice to our children. Be patient. Don't marry the wrong person. Even if it seems that she or he is all there is. Let's think about something. Isaac lives in Palestine. He is not to marry a Canaanite. There is nothing but Canaanites in Palestine. <laughs> Guys, there is no available woman that God wants Isaac to marry within a thousand miles of him. If you ever had an excuse, well, Lord, what do you expect? Of course I'm going to marry a Canaanite woman. That's all that lives within a thousand miles of me. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob would disagree with you. They would say it's too important of a decision. If there is not a person that God would want you to marry, then don't get married. Don't get married because you will be happier than marrying somebody you shouldn't be marrying. And so consequently, in this particular case, Isaac knows that God, it's God's will for him to be married. How do we know that? Well, because he's promised him children and descendants. Now, this is why, and let me say this about many of these points. 
many of these points, it's just not a simple crossover application into our lives. We don't always know that God wants us to get married or wants our children to get married. So we always have to keep that in mind because if he doesn't want them to get married, they may take a different course. But the point is still true one way or the other. Don't marry someone God does not have for you to marry. Look at how seriously they took this. How old was Isaac? How old was Isaac when he got married? Well, we know exactly how old he is, not from this passage. But we are told that when Isaac had Jacob and Esau, he was 60 years old. We are also told that Rebekah was barren for 20 years. Do the math. Isaac was 40 years old when he got married. Consequently, Isaac waited 40 years, at least 20, if you think realistically. For 20 years, he did not marry a Canaanite woman because he knew God did not want him to. Let me mention that there is another man in Scripture that was also 40 years old when he got married. His name is Esau. He did not wait. He was in the same situation that Isaac was in, and he married two Canaanite women. How did that turn out? Not very good. It did not turn out. In fact, it turned out so poorly that later on when he discovered that Isaac and Rebekah were disappointed in the fact that he married two women and two Canaanites, you know what he did? He went out and married a daughter of Ishmael. And that turned out even more poorly. And consequently, Edom is at war with God's people for the rest of biblical history because he wasn't patient. So first principle we learn from Abraham in this passage and from Isaac, be patient. How patient, Tom? Do you know how old Jacob was when he got married? 84. He waited 84 years to get married. That's how patient he was. He would not marry, and I've often wondered, how in the world does Jacob not marry? I mean, you, when we think of that story of Jacob and Esau, and, and, he, and Jacob is, is conniving to get the birthright, guys, Esau would have been a grandfather by that point. They were 76 years old. Esau got married at, when he was 40. He's been married for 36 years. He has kids who have kids. Isaac has none at all. Think about that. Think about that now, not Isaac, Jacob. Think about what Isaac's thinking. It's no wonder why Isaac thinks that the promise is supposed to go to Esau. My goodness, my son Jacob is 76 years old. He hasn't even gotten married. Why would I think he's the one that's going to have the promise go through him? I've got a son here, Esau. He's not just a great hunter and I like my game, but he's also a granddad. And in fact, if you look at the, the genealogy of, of Esau, my goodness, he has a zillion kids. And as those kids have a bunch of kids. I mean, Esau's family already by this point is going to be significantly large. Of course he's the promised one. Of course he's the one. He's the oldest and, and he's got all of these kids. And I don't know what happened to Jacob, but surely God's blessing is on this man. But he was wrong. And his wife tried to tell him he was wrong. No, the older will serve the younger. That can't possibly be the case. He doesn't even have a wife. He doesn't have any kids. He's also not married to a Canaanite. And he's patient. And you say, wow, that's a long time to be patient. Well, I guess God honored him because he outlived both of his wives. He was 60 years older than both of them, and he outlived them both. And the two uh, servant, their maid servants. Now, he had other problems because he had more than one wife, which was not God's will. But he got the first part right. He was patient. And he waited he got the second thing wrong. Leah was the one God appointed for him. But his eyes kept being drawn to Rachel. And Rachel was nothing but trouble. But we're not to that story yet. We're on this story. Be patient. Be attentive. Look at how attentive Abraham is. It is not an accident that he sends his servant to go and find a wife for Isaac at this time. Look back at chapter 22, if you have your Bibles, verse 30, verse 20. Now, after these things, this is right after Abraham offered up Isaac as a sacrifice and God stayed his hand. Now, after these things, it was told to Abraham, Behold, 
Milcah also has borne children to your brother Nahor, Uz, the firstborn, Buzz, the brother, Kemuel, the father of Aram, Kesed, and Hazo, and Pildash, and Jidlap, and Bethuel. And Bethuel fathered Rebekah. These eight Milcah bore to Nahor, Abraham's brother. Moreover, his concubine, whose name was Rumah, bore Teba, Gaham, Tahash, and Maacha. In other words, Abraham heard about Rebekah. Word had come to him that his family is growing wildly over in Mesopotamia. And he has heard the name of one woman, at least in this list, and her name was Rebekah. And somewhere along the way here, Abraham in his prayers, God in his revelation, it became clear to Abraham that it was God's will that Rebekah was the one. I've often thought he just went looking for anybody. No. Abraham sent his servant to bring back Rebekah. He didn't tell his servant to bring back Rebekah. He said, find a wife amongst my family. But I think Rebekah has already been identified. And God is already behind it. How do I know this? Because when his servant says, what if she won't come? What if she won't come? What does Abraham say? Oh, she's going to come. And why is that, Abraham? Because the Lord is going to send his angel before you. Well, how do you know that, Abraham? Because apparently God and Abraham are talking. Apparently they're talking and God says, Yep, I've got a woman for your son. And I will send my angel before your servant and he will guide him to her. And he will bring about what I have already appointed. In other words, Abraham is attentive. Now, we'll come back to this, but let me just give you some applications as parents and grandparents. We should be praying for our children. We need to be listening to God. Do you think God could actually reveal to us the person that he wants our son or daughter to marry? Why not? He did it with Abraham. He does it with several people in Scripture. Why, why shouldn't we participate in that whole... I know they don't want us to. In our culture, are you kidding? we got to keep our nose out of it. We should be praying for that person. And we should be listening for God to give us indication. And Abraham handles this perfectly. He knows what's going on, but he does not... He doesn't become controlling. He lets God control it. He lets God handle it. He could have sent the servant, this is who I want you to go get, go to Bethuel, bring back Rebecca, she's the one. No, let God do it. But he's praying and he's listening and he's saying, it's time. It's time for us to find a wife for Isaac. He's also unwavering. He's unwavering in this way. When his servant says, but what if she won't come? Abraham's pretty confident she's going to come. But he wants to make something clear. Well, if she doesn't come, I stand by my convictions. You will not get him a wife amongst the Canaanites, and you will not let him leave this land. Because whether she comes or not will not change my convictions of who is the right person for him. Whether she can agree or not will not change whether or not God says this is... In other words, Abraham will not settle. And he wants to make it clear to his servant. I believe she's going to come because I think the Lord is working in her life and in her heart. But if she doesn't, I will not settle for something less than God has for my son. He has unwavering convictions. And we need to have those convictions. Our kids need those convictions. Since our children and our grandchildren are the ones that make these decisions, we need to instill these qualities in them while they're growing up and while we still have influence over them. Be practical, number four. And then the servant took ten of his master's camels and departed, taking all sorts of choice gifts from his master. And he arose and went to Mesopotamia, to the city of Nahor. And he made the camels kneel down outside the city by the well of water at the time of evening. 
the time when women go out to draw water. Be practical. He doesn't just go anywhere and sit in the middle of the desert and think, God, bring her to me. Where does he go? He goes to a place where there will be young women, where the young women come out to the well. He's practical. Now, my kids are probably going to hate me for saying this, but it is true. There is a reason why I encourage my kids to go to a Christian college. And it wasn't because I thought they needed to learn the Bible better. They already knew more about the Bible than many of the people in that college. Why do I want them there? Because it's a well. <laughs> because it's a well where you can find young, committed Christians who Jesus is first in their life. Now, I don't know if God wants them to get married or not, but I do know this. If he does want them to get married, he wants them to marry somebody who loves them. And honestly, to have them remain in Deer Lodge is like having you know, this servant go out in the middle of the wilderness and wait for a girl to come to him. No, you go to the well. You go to a place where those people are. Even this servant has that kind of practicality. He recognizes you got to find the place where the right people will be. That's why you go to his father's house. And I'll jump ahead here a little bit. Why is that the right place? Did you notice how many times Laban and Bethuel use the name Yahweh? Well, this is what Yahweh says. Who are we to disagree? They know it. They know the name Yahweh. Now, don't get me wrong. I think we learn from Laban. He worships other gods too. But at least they are familiar with Abraham's God. And they fear him. They're afraid of him. They look at Abraham's God and think he's someone to listen to. You just don't mess with it. So at least this group of people has a sense of Abraham's God and who he is and he is, that he is to be feared. And Rebecca seems to understand this as well. She is, she is going to be obedient to this God's voice and his direction. Practical. Notice the next thing he does here is to be prayerful. It's not just Abraham that's praying, it's also the servant. Consequently, it's not just we that should be praying. We should encourage our kids and our grandkids. You need to be praying. You need to be praying about this. The servant says, O oh Lord God of my master Abraham, please grant me success today and show steadfast love to my master Abraham. He prays, and in his prayer he lays out a fleece. We use that word from Gideon, but that's what this is. He, he lays out a test. And he says, Lord, I need you to show me. I need you to guide me to the right person. But it begins with prayer. Be assertive. You know, when you read his fleece, you think what he's saying is, let there be a woman who comes out and offers me water and then offers to water my camels. But apparently that's not what he's thinking. Because what he does is, when a woman comes out and he sees her and he feels like, this may be the woman, what does he do? He runs. He runs to her and he says to her, will you give me a drink? Now, at this point, his fleece doesn't seem to be that impressive. If you set a, a fleece and you say, Lord, uh, have the woman it's supposed to be, the woman, the right woman, the woman for Isaac, have her offer me a drink. If you're going to run to her and say, will you give me a drink, it seems like you're kind of betting, your, you know, hedging your bet. But he takes the initiative. He takes the, he's assertive. He goes and says, can I have a drink? And she says, sure. That's not very impressive, at least for a test. But for her to also say, and let me water your camels, that is impressive. Be particular. <laughs> Go to a general place, but don't just accept anybody that comes down here. Be sure, be clear, let God direct you. Be particular who you're looking for. Let me water your camels. Let's see all the issues here. I mentioned a couple weeks ago that a camel drinks somewhere between 40 and 80 gallons of water. 
He has 10 of them. That's somewhere between 400 and 800 gallons of water. A pot may hold, let's say it holds five gallons of water. Guys, that's 40 pounds of water. I doubt it. I know she's a strong girl, but that's a lot of water to be hauling up and down from a, wherever she's coming from. So let's just say two gallons. That's 16 pounds. If you've got to haul that home, that, that'd be something. If you're going to be watering something, two gallons. Guys, if it's 400 gallons, two gallons is going to take 200 trips. 200 trips to the well to water those camels. It's evening. Now here's the thing I think I've read over for years, and maybe you have too. Did you notice the man is not alone? He has servants. And they're right there because he mentions them in a minute. Do you have a place for us? His male, male servants are right there with those camels. And she still offers. My goodness, anybody else would come along and say, well, he doesn't need my help. He's got a bunch of guys to do that. What kind of woman is this lady? Here, sure, I'll give you a drink and let me water your camels too, even though I know it's going to take forever. Maybe she doesn't know. Just think of all the things that this tells us about Rebecca. I just have a list here. This is what I learned about Rebecca there. She is extremely hospitable to strangers. This guy's a stranger. She goes out of her way, way out of her way to be hospitable to him. Do you think that's an important quality? Well, it seems to be a really important quality of the household of Abraham. To not be hospitable to, to strangers is get you a Sodom and Gomorrah. Lot and Abraham, they're hospitable. And it's one of the ways, I think it's one of the reasons why they do not have that much conflict with their neighbors. Because they're incredibly hospitable in a world that is inhospitable. And here we have Rebecca having the exact same quality. She's generous. She is strong. You have to be strong to move that much water. Hard working is an understatement. This woman is not afraid to work hard. But you know what I like the most? Let me just read this one little verse here about how she did it. If you look at Genesis 24, my pages are sticking together already. Verse uh, 19, she said to him, or, or she said, drink my Lord, and she quickly let down her jar upon her hand and gave him a drink. And when she had finished giving him a drink, she said, I will draw water for your camels also until they have finished drinking. I'm not just going to give them a little drink. I'm going to give them a drink until they're done drinking. So she quickly emptied her jar into the trough and ran again to the well to draw water. Do you see that? She's eager. She's running. <laughs> of course, if you're going to get these camels watered before nightfall, you're going to have to run. She's a hardworking, eager to serve person. And she's persistent. Which brings us to the next point. Be cautious. Wow, this is a lesson I would love my kids to learn. <laughs> Uh, all of us need to learn it. Do you know, I think at this point, most of us would be going, God has spoken. <laughs> the woman is come down. She has offered to water my camels. What else do I need to know? What else do I need to know? She, clearly, she is the one for my servant Isaac, for my master Isaac. Clearly, does God really need to do anything more? Look how cautious this guy is. A woman has come down, offered him a drink, now is watering his camels. Is he absolutely certain that it's her yet? No, he's still cautious. Notice what it says in verse 21. The man gazed at her in silence to learn whether the Lord had prospered his journey or not. In other words, he wasn't sure yet. He wasn't sure whether or not the Lord had prospered his journey yet. Why? Because his actual fleece was this, that she would water my camels completely. Now you think about this. 
Many kids are this way. Maybe she has little experience with a camel. <laughs> and she offers to water them. And she doesn't really realize that. That's about 40 gallons apiece. This is going to be quite an effort. Maybe she doesn't know it. So what is he doing? He's sitting there watching her. Watching what? To see if she finishes the job. It's the only thing left. It's the only thing left for him to see. It's one thing for a person to say, let me water your camels. It's another thing to see it through until it's completely done. And it is not until he sees it through. He is that cautious. Okay. Wow, she's persistent. And maybe she's had some experience with camels and, and maybe she knew how much work this was going to be and, and if that's the case, uh, even better. But even if she didn't and wasn't aware of what was going to happen, it doesn't matter. She made a commitment and she finished it. She does what she says. That's a great quality. That's a great quality in a spouse. And when she finishes, he needs to be certain. Because believe it or not, it still is not certain that it's her. Why? Because he doesn't know her. Now, I don't think this is an application for today. I think this is very unique here, but my wife said it in the car right over, and I really loved it. She hasn't met, he hasn't met her family yet. <laughs> you cannot be certain until you meet her dad. That's just the way it is. <laughs> you can't be certain until you meet her dad. Well, in this case, it's very true because there was a fleece given at the beginning, and it's not really a fleece. Abraham said, bring back a wife from my family. If this woman is not a part of Abraham's kinsmen, all of these signs are meaningless, and the servant is ready to walk away. Think about that. Any one of us, we'd be like, we wouldn't even look for it. We wouldn't even think about it. Clearly God is in this. And we'd jump right in and this God is behind this. Not this guy. There's one more thing that has to be true. She must be from Abraham's family. So he says in verse 23, Please tell me whose daughter you are. And is there room in your father's house for us to spend the night? Who's your family? And are they as hospitable as you are? And do you have the kind of relationship with them that you can speak for them? Because she's going to go on to say, I am the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Milcah, whom she bore to Nahor, and she added, We have plenty of both straw and fodder and room to spend the night. Boy, he learned a lot about Rebecca there. He learned a lot about her family. And he learned about, a lot about how her family thinks of this young girl. That she can speak so openly to offer their home to strangers. But he learned the most important thing. That she was from the family of Abraham. And so now he is certain. Be certain. And because of that he does certain things. Be straightforward. Believe it or not, I think we need to encourage our kids with this. You wouldn't think we would have to, but I think we have to. What I'm getting at here is when that servant goes to her house, what does he do? He retells the story, but listen to how he tells it. He wants this family to know, I am here because the Lord my God has brought me here. Look at how many times he mentions the name Yahweh and what Yahweh is doing. I prayed to my God and I laid this before him and he answered my prayer. And here comes your daughter Rebecca. And she does exactly what he says. The whole rest of this chapter is a servant being absolutely straightforward with this family about who his God is and his relationship with him and the fact that he prays for him and that he is the God of Isaac and that he is the God of Abraham and that it is God who is working here. He holds nothing back. Guys, we have to encourage our kids to do that. 
You cannot keep your faith. I'm not going to say hidden. I don't think they, they're tempted to keep it hidden. You need to put it out in front of you. That's what this man did. And notice how he ends it here. And if that, this is too much for you. <laughs> if this story about what my God is doing is too much, well, just let me know and I'll go either to the right or the left. But I want it out front. I want it completely out front. This is my God. This is my faith. This is what's important to me. This is what's going on. This is what my God is doing. Can you handle it? Because if you can't handle it, you're not the right one for me. It is not about finding another Christian to marry for our children. It's about a person who wears God right up front and is ashamed of nothing and hides nothing and is bold in talking about their faith and what they believe and who they're following. He's picked a winner because this is Rebecca, and we'll see this. Be straightforward. Be insistent. This seems strange. How can you be both cautious and insistent? He wakes up, and they say, you're right, God, who, we can't stand in the way. This is God's will. Everybody's in agreement. It's clear that God has put his finger on Rebecca and says she's the one. And he wakes up the next morning and says, we want, well, send, send me away. It's time to leave. And their response was what? Oh, please, I get it. If I, I'm going to say the same thing. Can we have at least 10 days? I mean, you're taking her 1,000 miles away. I wasn't, you know, I wasn't prepared for this yesterday, and now today you want to take my daughter. I'm with them. I'm completely with these guys. But you see what he does. There's no reason to wait. God has spoken. This is the person. There's no reason to make my master wait. It's time to leave. And besides... By insisting here, and I don't know if there's an application in our day, so don't take one. But by insisting here, this man's going to find out some other things about Rebecca. Look what he finds out. He sees Rebecca's willingness to follow and her faith without seam. What a remarkable lady. Will you go a thousand miles away with this guy that you met yesterday? To marry a man that you've never seen? never even heard of until yesterday to a land you've never been to are you willing Rebecca to do that solely on the fact that God has demonstrated that he has put his hand upon you and said you're the wife I have for Isaac and she says I will go wow that's faith and obedience. Be expected. You know, when you're patient and you insist on having what God wants for you, look what Isaac does at the end. He comes in from Be Be uh, Be Lahai Roy, and he goes out into the field in the evening, and what does it say he's doing? He's meditating. Boy, everybody's praying here. Abraham's praying, the servant's praying, Isaac's praying. And what is he praying for? He's praying for his bride. That's why he's out there in the field in the evening. What's he doing out there? The same thing the father was doing out there when the prodigal son was away, looking for him to come. And Isaac was looking for his bride to come. And he lifts up his eyes and he sees her. And you know what I see here is when you see a person who's willing to wait on the Lord and be patient and be obedient and trust him, God is good. He is good in what he gives. That God is good and will reward his servant for patiently waiting on him. Which is why the story ends with, and Isaac loved her. Of course he did, because God picked her. You don't have to worry about Isaac loving her. God picked her, and Isaac trusted him, and he trusted God's will, and of course he gave him 
not a good wife, a great wife. Notice, Isaac and Rebecca, there's something missing in this relationship. There's no Hagar. There's no Zilpah. There's no Rachel. <laughs> there's no Bilhah. There's just Isaac and Rebekah the way God intended it. Because he waited. And he listened. And he followed that lead. Let's stand. And let's sing this song. Christ be beside me.